I, I titled this, this sermon, The Grass is Greener on the Other Side. <laughs> you know, um, you're supposed to laugh, but maybe not. <laughs> All right. Uh, the grass is greener on the other side. It's not a joke. Um, so let's pray. <laughs> let's pray. Let's, 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 let's step into heaven here. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you so much for, for that amazing time that we had worshiping you. Thank you that we get to connect through worship. It is something that, Father, we've been in concerts. We've been in, in, in places with music and Nothing is the same when we use that to worship you, God. It's, it's just your sense of your presence, of your peace, that, uh, that nothing compares to it. What, what a privilege we have of being your, your, your children, Lord, your sons and your daughters. Then we get to worship you, Lord, and we can, we can just get to experience you, Lord. And we thank you so much. Thank you for what you're doing here. And I, I pray, Lord, that you will touch every single person here, Lord. Regardless of the situation, God, whatever they are going through right now, Lord, we just, we just pray for them, Lord. To the ones who are so on top of the world right now and everything is going well, thank you for that. To the ones who are struggling, Lord Jesus, to, to the ones who are confused or in fear because of something or anxiety is coming, Lord. Or, or Father, something that is still in their joy. Father, I pray that you would stretch out your hands and you will touch them, Lord. Then they will know that no then you love them, Lord, and there is hope for them. Father, I pray for that, Lord. I thank you so much, Lord. Speak to us as we read your scriptures, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. The grass is greener on the other side. There's a beautiful story of the people of Israel when they were crossing uh, uh, the river. Actually, when it started with you know, being a slave um, in Egypt and then how God delivered them and did an amazing miracle there, passing them through the Red Sea and, uh, you know, on, on dry land, and then it went into the desert. You know, the desert was supposed to be if you walk straight. If you walk straight there, it takes 40 days. If you come from that, the place to where the promised land is, it takes 40 days to walk in there. But because of the rebellion and because of uh, everything that they went through and the disobedient and they trying to do it without God and, and even with God continuously, you know, provided for them and guide them. And, you know, it took them 40 years. Imagine that. Imagine you waiting for a promise and God said, I'm going to bless them in two, three weeks. And you are like trying to do it on your own and trying to walk without God and all that sign and that, you know, you are now 40 years old and that promise was when you were 17. And that happens sometimes, you know, happens to me sometimes. I'm seeing right now some of the promises that God did in my life uh, when I was 17 years old, when I gave my life to Jesus, prophecies and promises. And then I say, I believe it. And, and I'm starting to see some of the things now. There is no rush in the kingdom of God. The, the most important thing to know is that even where in their disobedience and in, in their moments where they were not um, uh, walking necessarily so close to God, God used that moment to prepare their hearts. And when they were ready and ready and ready, God rose a leader um, uh, trained by Moses, the original leader who received the promise, um, and now is in the hands of this young man, uh, but not so young, but, you know, uh, like around 40-something. And, uh, and, you know, is, 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 is about to just cross, um, take the team, the team, the, the people of Israel into that promised land, the promise that they were waiting for for the longest time. Of course, the grass is greener on the other side. They were in the desert. They were in, um, in, in the desert. How many people are here in the desert? Things don't go well with you. Things are not how you expected. Business went down. Your life, your experience, your, 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 your sleep, you cannot sleep, your relationships, uh, your finances, your health. Um, we all go through different things in life, right? We all do. And, uh, but there is hope. The grass is greener on the other side. You know, uh, we, have, we have that saying, um, you know, we always think, it, we, being in Mexico, uh, <laughs> we always dream about going to the States. You know, that North American dream. I remember watching movies when I was uh, 17 years old, 16 years old, and, 
and these movies, and it's like, oh, my goodness, life is so good in the United States. And look at over here. It's like oh, we all want to go. You know, that's why we have millions of Latin you know, people immigrating to the States. It's they present it to you. It's like life is green on this side. And then you come here, and you walk and work and work and work for taxes. And it's different. Anyway, so that's not, a, that is not, my, ta- my, that's not my sermon. But uh, life is good. Life is good here. And we bless this country. It's so good to be here. <laughs> but... Um, uh, there is always that, you know, and then somebody said, you know, uh, grass is greener on the other side, or actually grass is green where you water, you know, your grass, you know, come on. And that you're always, your grass is always going to bring, uh, be green where you water it. And, um, and I believe all of that. You know, I believe that you need to sow into the things that you have right now. You need to sow and then you need to pour into, into what you have right now. Then you, you can, I believe that you can make it happen wherever you are right now in your life. And I do believe also that there is a guidance of the Holy Spirit that will lead you into places and territories that you don't know where the grass is greener than where you are. Are you with me, church? And there is a story here, and I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but the story is going to explain something beautiful to us. And, uh, and as we are praying for, 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 for revival, and, and, and listen to this, um, you know, with, the, with the, everything that we are seeing on, on, on the social media, uh, the moves of God in, in everywhere, in different schools, in different universities, in different churches, in different parts of the world how God the Holy Spirit is moving and um, and then we all there is an anticipation there is something inside of us that is like um, we want that here as well right don't don't we we want the move of God here in in Victoria we want God to move in our church and that and 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 there is that that's a part of in us and it's like we know that there is more God we want to see more fruits we want to see more people turning to Jesus we want to see all of that and, and the reality is that revival is nothing else than the church waking up. It's nothing, nothing so special, nothing so important, nothing so magic that it's like all of a sudden we think that revival is something that is going to come from heaven. And it's like all of a sudden I'm going to start feeling goosebumps and, uh, and it's like, whoa, this revival. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's not nothing like that. Though there is something powerful at the same time that, that, that goes on the inside of us that is starting to bring the passion for Jesus back again. You know, and, and, and that, that, that passion, then all of a sudden, church becomes the place where I want to be. I want to be at, at church. I want to be with my, with my family of, in Christ because I want to worship, and I want to be motivated, and I want to be alive. And I, I just can't wait to be with the family of God worshiping Jesus. And all of a sudden, he becomes your passion to the point that you go to work on Monday or you go to school on, on Monday, and then you realize it's like, man, this person is so miserable. Is going through something. They need good news. Are you with me? And I know the per- I know the God who woke me up, who is giving me passion, who is giving me hope, who is giving me that revelation that you know I can do it and I can make it. And all of a sudden, you become passionate about sharing that. That is revival. Revival is the church that all of a sudden becomes alive again because it begins to dreams and begin to see that God is real. It's not a religious person who is just found on a religious. Religion, uh, religious activity on a Sunday morning, and that's church, and that's it, and it's boring. No, it's the God who we worship when we are together. It's the God who is alive, who can speak to you any time of the day if you are hungry for, for him, and that is revival, and that is what always we pray for it. But what, does, what, what causes revival? Revival is caused by Exalting Jesus, pursuing Him, pursuing His presence, pursuing, it's exalting Him, it's exalting His name. It's, it, it's, it's not pursuing revival that is going to bring revival, it's pursuing Jesus that is going to wake us up and revive us on the inside. Are, are you with me, church? There is, a, there is a moment here in, in the time of Israel when they were in the desert and they were about to cross to the promised land. And that promised land, imagine, that is revival. That is the presence of God so alive and so, oh, so real in your life that we all want. 
Joshua 3, 1 to 6. Joshua 3, 1 to 6. It says there, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites, they were about to cross, right? They remember that part. I'm going to go really fast here. It says, also they left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River. It says here, when they camped before crossing, three days later, the Israelites' officers went through um, the camp, giving these instructions to the people. There is always instructions of how we are going to cross. When we go into, into new territories in the, in the Lord, there is always instructions. The, what, a, what, a, what a great way to receive instructions that, from this book. But gave them instructions to the people. It says, when you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out from your positions and follow them. Listen careful, he says. Since you have never traveled this way before, have, I, I don't know, but I'm, I believe that God is about to do something that the church has never experienced before. I believe that. We have marked revival to the point that we think what, what we are to expect now. But I believe in my heart then God is going to do something in the church that we've never been before. It's going to be crazy. Are you excited about that? I, 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 I'm excited, but at the same time, I'm like, ooh. It says, you, you've never, you follow them, it says, since you never traveled this way before, they will guide you. What? The ark. What does it mean, the presence? The presence of God. It says, stay about half a mile behind them. It says, keep a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't even come close to it. It's so holy. It's so pure. You don't want to play with that. You don't want to even come close to that. Not to be in fear, but to be in reverence of that. It's not a joke. Amen? Then Joshua told the people, purify yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do Great wonders among you. I love that part. I be, uh, for the last two, three, actually, see, I, I believe since January, but for the last two, three, I've been mentioning this, uh, three Sundays, I've been mentioning this. this. I, I, I feel like God is saying this. Purify yourself for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders, wonders among you. And I mentioned it last week, and I'm going to mention this again. The whole thing of purifying yourself is not like so you can be holy for the sake of being holy, and all of a sudden, you know, so you can be holy, you can have a pure heart, or you can have a, a mind that is pure and it's transformed and it's renewed because God wants to bless you. He wants to pour his blessings on you and you will not be able to handle that. The pressure and the weight of the glory of the blessings of the Lord if we still live in compromised life where, where, where we are here at church and we're doing things like that but we are here. Del- I'm talking about deliberately making choices and then, then don't please the Lord. Are you with me church? And, and he says, purify, you know, I'm going to do something so great in your life. I'm going to bless you so much. It's time for you to purify your, your life. What does it mean? And I talk about pur- purity or holiness uh, last week. It holy means that you are absolutely set apart for God, set apart, completely set apart for the Lord. And it talks about purify yourself, puri- purify yourself. It's like, God, clean me. Just... Cleanse me with your word. Cleanse me with your presence. Cleanse me with your, with your Holy Spirit. It's just the, that desire that revival brings to you. The presence of God brings revival into you. And all of a sudden, there is no satisfaction anymore in the things of this world. There, there's nothing that pleases you more than being in God's presence. You're doing business as normal. You're doing business as normal you're relating to people you're going to school you're studying for your tests you want to be you want to have good marks you're doing life you want to go to the beach you want to have friends you want to enjoy life but you know that you know that the thing that pleases you the most is that presence that you carry when you are doing those things that you know that you are in God's presence in God's kingdom are you with me church and that is the desire that it needs to be in all of us as believers. The desire that I'm going to do business, but I know who I am serving. I, I know I'm going to go to school, but I know who is my, 
my master. And when somebody comes and puts me down, I know who I am. And when somebody comes and elevates me, I know who I am in Christ. And pride won't take over me. Or depression will not control my life. Are you with me, church? Purify yourself tomorrow. I'm going to do great things. It's for your own benefit. Not for my own benefit. It's what God is saying. So in the morning, Joshua said to the priest, lift up the ark of the covenant and lead the people across the river. It says here, so, and they so started out and went ahead of the people. They just went and began to lead them. Quickly, let's go to verse 2, chapter 4. Chapter 4. It says, when all the people have crossed the Jordan, from, from one, I'm, I'm going to try to read the whole thing. Um, <laughs> When all the people have crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now I've chosen 12 men, one of each tribe. He says, Tell them, take 12 stones from, from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up in a place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the 12 men he had chosen. He says, One from each tribe of Israel. I love that God doesn't make exceptions. Amen. Everybody's included. It says, see, hold them. And then he told them, it says, go into the middle of the Jordan. It says, in front of the ark of the Lord your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry them out on your shoulder. They're pretty, pretty big probably. It says, you know, it says 12 stones in all. It says, it says, one of them for each tribe of Israel. We will use them. We will use these stones to build a memorial and in the future, your children, everything that we do has a testimony, has something powerful for the next generation. Like that song said, I, I dream of that generation. It says, in the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? And you will tell them, they remind us of the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. And the men did as Joshua had commanded them. They obeyed. They did what the Lord, what him, you know, what the Lord said through Joshua. It says, they took 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan River and says, and one, of, one for each tribe. Just as the Lord had told Joshua, they carried them to the place where they, were, they, they, where they camped for the night and constructed a memorial there. Joshua also set up another pile of 12 stones in the middle of the Jordan, and says, and at that place where the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they, and they are there until this day. It says, the priests who were carrying the Ark stood in the middle of the river. Pay attention to us, everything I'm reading. You know, I'm I, I, I probably struggling here, but uh, there is also, you can, you can follow me there and read it in proper English. Um, the, the priests who were carrying the ark stood in the middle of the river until the, all of the Lord's commands that Moses had given to Joshua were carried out. They waited. It says, meanwhile, the people hurry across the riverbed. It says, and when everybody was safely on the other side, the priests crossed over with the ark of the Lord as the people watch. The armed warriors from the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, it says here, led the Israelites across the Jordan just as Moses had directed it. It's not a small little group of people. Listen to this. It says, they, the, this armed men were about 40,000 strong. 40,000. Just, just, just the men. I'm not talking about the, the, the women and the children, the family. It was, it was massive, like a lot of people there. They were ready for battle. The, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I thought that... Uh, you know, I look at pictures of the Jordan River nowadays. You know, I'm like, the Jordan River. So I, I went and was looking into the Jordan River. It looked like, you know, people are swimming there. And they, it looked like it's, you know, it's from here to about there. And it's like, they didn't need a miracle to go through. You know, you know they could probably swim and not a big deal. <laughs> right, be on the other side. But, but we're going to learn something here. Because, you know, I, 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 you know it's, it's a small little river right now, you know, full of mud in some areas, you know, where people go get baptized. I want to get baptized in the Jordan River. It's magic. And it's a small little thing. Anyway, <clears throat> there was outside of uh, just a quick commercial here. Uh, 14, it says that the, the, the day of the Lord made Joshua a great leader in the eyes of the Israelites. And it says for the rest of his life, they revered him as much as they had revered um, 
Moses. The Lord said to Joshua, command the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to come up out of the riverbed. So Joshua gave the command. As soon as the priests carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came up out of the riverbed and their feet were on high ground, the water of the Jordan returned and overflowed its bank as before. Since the people crossed the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month, it says, and they camped at Gilgal just, as, just east of Jericho. It was there at Gilgal that Joshua piled up the 12 stones taken from the Jordan River. Then Joshua said to the Israelites, he says, in the future your children will ask. He says, what do these stones mean? Then you will tell them, this is where the Israelites crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the river right before your eyes. It says, and he kept it dry until they were all across just as he did at the rivers, at the Red Sea. It says, when they dried it up until they all have crossed over. They did this to all the nations of the earth. Might know that the Lord's hands is powerful so you may fear the Lord your God forever. Praise God. I finished reading in the Old Testament. <laughs> I read it, you know, I read it in English, but I read it not out loud to friends of people. So, you know, it's, it's always a challenge. But, um, but what, a, what, a bla- what, a, what an amazing story. I hope you, you understood what, what just happened. I was thinking about this, you know, um, about the river. It's like, it's a sign Listen to this. Then they were crossing into a new life. It, it is a sign that they were coming into a new territory. It was a sign that there was a before and there was an after. Right? There, there was a, I was trying to remember this, that you have to remember this, that it was 40 years since the, the, the Red Sea was parted halfway through and the people of Israel went through 40 years in that 40 years some people have died probably the older people that were cross you know cross the, the Red Sea they probably have died new people new 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 kids new babies probably were born and now they are 40 years old and the only experience that they had is what they heard about the Red Sea are you with me and it's like God is showing them something that probably, probably it didn't really need to as far as, oh, this is a dangerous river that you can never cross on your own like the Red Sea. Nobody can cross the Red Sea. Imagine a million people crossing. There was a two, like about two million people crossing the Red Sea. It needed to be a miracle in there because otherwise they were going to die. It was a substantial miracle that needed to take place then. But the Jordan River... They probably could have made it there, except that the Lord had a purpose and a plan for them. Because they needed to understand that where they were going, it was a new territory that they'd never been before. And in order for us, for you and I to go into a new territory we've never been before, we cannot go with the experience of other people. We can never go into this new territory and take over the, what God has for us if we only have heard of the things that the Lord has done in the previous generation. It's like, I'm going to show you in a, in a, in a, in a minor way what I've done. So all of a sudden, what you heard that I did, you can see that I can also do it in you and through you. Are you with me, church? I want you to have your own experience. Because the enemy is real. The enemy is it's alive. The enemy is against you. The enemy wants to destroy you. And you will never be able to stand firm and stand alone with God if you only have experienced me through the testimony of other people. And I want you to have your own testimony and your own experience. And therefore, I'm going to part the waters. And you're going to know, wow. So that is in a minor version of what happened in a big way back in the days. 
I was trying to think about this. I know I wasn't born in a Christian home, but I talked to many of you who had the privilege, honestly, of being born in Christian homes. But you need to have your own testimony. You cannot rely on the testimony of your parents. Oh, when we were poor. I heard, I, I, I love hearing testimonies. I just met, not just, but a few years ago, I met with these guys who were millionaires, multimillionaires, multimillionaires, living in the mainland. And I was talking to them, and, and this guy wrote a book, and he said, he's a millionaire. We're sitting across from each other. He's an older man. And he's telling me his testimony when they didn't have a single penny. When his wife comes to me and says, Pepe, I was on my way. My kids, I had like many kids who I couldn't afford the dentist. And a dentist across the, the other side of the mainland say, I can, I can take care of your kids. I won't, I won't pay you. I won't charge you. I won't charge you. I won't pay you. Dentists don't pay. I deal with them. Um, I, will, I won't charge you. And the lady was so happy and so excited about that. And it's like, okay. And, and then halfway through, realized I don't have gas to make it there. So she pulled over in a gas station. It's like a, she's pulling there, putting gas. And, and she comes in and I said to the guy, you know, I, I don't have any money. I don't, and I need to take my kids to the dentist. You know, that one of them is suffering. And, uh, and, and the guy's like, and then she's like, I'll give you my wedding ring. And, and I, we, as soon as I have money, I come and, and buy it back from you. And the guy is like, no, man, you, you, you're showing me something. You know, just go, just go. Fill your car with gas and then go. And, and, and then you pay me back. She says, we went there and we paid them back and everything. And said, you know, and we always were faithful. She, she's telling me the testimonies. And I'm hearing these guys in this mansion. It's mansion. And I know of how much, a little bit of, how, of what they have. And she's telling me with humility her testimony. And I'm saying, wow, God, what an amazing. And she's saying, you know, we've always been faithful with the Lord. We've always been faithful with our tithes and our offers, offerings. Always, always, she says, even when we didn't have money. And she's telling me that, and my heart is like, ah, it's getting, it's, you know what I'm saying? When somebody's telling you with humility the testimony, and then you see the result, and you say, God, I want that. I want that in my life. When I hear testimonies of missionaries who gave their life to bring the gospel, including, you know, the reason I'm safe is for missionaries who got saved in that Jesus Revolution movie that is happening now in the 70s, who exposed their life and come into Mexico. And, and gave the, some of them gave their life. Some of them have had accidents with the small little planes bringing the gospel into the small little jungles of Mexico and things like that. And you hear testimonies like that. And you say, wow, you probably heard your parents saying, you know, we didn't have any money and we did this but the Lord is being good to us and the Lord is faithful to us and you probably heard your testimony the testimony of your parents and I'm talking to the young younger people here of your parents following Jesus and your parents doing this and that and this is all all of that is good and encourage us but it will mean nothing 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 until you have your own personal experience with God because just like them sharing their hearts of their experience with Jesus, of what God has done for them. And I'm talking about material things, but the most important is salvation. The salvation of the souls. And all of a sudden, you, you will not be able to stand firm when the attacks of the enemy come. When you go to university and all of a sudden your teachers begin to teach you something false and something wrong. Or your friends are saying, what are you doing there? That doesn't mean anything. Don't become religious. This is where the fans start. You know what where, where it is. And then all of a sudden, you will go and give in to those things if you don't have your personal experience with God. But if you have your personal experience with God, you will know who you are. And you will know where you stand and you will know what brings life and you will know who you want to please and he is the God who's going to give you favor and a blessing and he's going to give you and part the water so you can go and have your own experience and that no one can take from you I can come and preach about testimony for other people but if I haven't had my own testimony I will not be passionate I will not stand firm even with my, all my thousand mistakes that I make a day, 
my faith remains. Because I have my own Jordan River experience. Praise God for the Red Sea experience of others. But I need my own Jordan River experience in my life. And that's what is going to hold me. When people come and say, hey, I've never seen people being demon possessed. And then people see deliverance anymore. You came too late. I've seen it. I've done it. Don't get scared. It's easy. Because it's not in your name. It's in the name of Jesus. I've seen people being healed. I've seen it. If your old teacher say, oh, that's part of the New, the, the New Testament in the book of Acts. No, I've seen it. You, you need to see it. You need to see it. How is your own experience with God? You can have your own experience with God. Some of you may say, you know, uh, I, I was born in a Christian home. I, 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 I don't, I, I'm still here, and it's great. Praise God for that. But there is to be a point in your life that there is a turning point. There has to be a point in your life where it's no longer I want to go because my parents are making me go. I want to go because I love him so much. When did that happen? There's always a middle, a, a, middle a, a turning point. Even if you've never stopped going to church, the motivation now all of a sudden becomes a personal thing. You have to remember the day where you became safe. My wife, I remember, she said that she grew up in a Christian home, but at 13 she had a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit. She got filled with the Holy Spirit. She got baptized with the Holy Spirit. She had an encounter with Jesus. And since then, she went to youth group. When all they wanted to do was play games. And she's like, can we just read the scriptures? Can we just read the Bible? Can we just pray? And that was a personal experience with her. I wonder what's your personal experience with in, in you, in your life. And I know that you have your own personal experience. But if you don't, you need to have one. If you haven't had a personal experience with God, you need to have one. You know, I remember the date. I have it written down because I'm getting old, but November 7, 1987, around 9 o'clock, when I gave my life to Jesus. I'm old. Crossing the Jordan River for the people of Israel, it meant, it represented something significantly in their lives. They were no longer under the Old Testament. They were no longer under Moses, but they were coming into a personal experience, living by grace, the grace of God. We have to have that personal experience with God. We have to have that. Look what it says here in Job, Job, Job. Job 42.5. Are you guys good? Yeah? Awesome. That's a confusing part. It's like you, you say the name different like, than you say the, the job. I have a job. But you say, anyway. Uh, 42. It says, I had only heard about you before. This is, this is Job. I want to say in the Spanish, hope. <laughs> that was the experience that he had before. He went through everything that he went through only to know this. And that's where everything changed. You know that? After this, God began to restore everything because he knew he had his heart. You know that? He was after a man's own heart. Like after God's heart, he was faithful. And he went through everything that he went through. And God will not release it. But when he said this, you start reading the scriptures, everything changed. Because God knows I have his heart now. He says, I had only heard about you before. How many of you? And I'm, when I'm saying this, I'm not telling you in judgment because I don't even know who I'm talking to. But you know if it is you. I've only heard about you before, but now 
I have seen you with my own eyes. God wants you to have your own experience. Number two, God wants you to remember what he has done in your life. These are some of the points. If you're putting points in there, it's like the first one is God wants you to have your own experience. Number two is God wants, he he wants you to remember what he has done in your life. To remember. We live in a world of distractions. We live in a world where we often forget we belong to. You know, we belong to the Lord. The enemy wants us to forget who God is in our lives. You know, when we, you know, that happened to me. I don't know if it happened to you. But if all of a sudden I stop coming to church and all of a sudden I start praying and all of a sudden I start reading my, my Bible, I forget who I am. You know, that's one of the craziest things about when, when we went through COVID, that we couldn't meet and we couldn't do anything. Like that is like, I'm actually kind of liking this thing. Like I don't need to do anything else. And it's like, oh, I actually like, you know, not hanging out with people. And I actually like to be this really quiet. What, do we have to go to church? No, we just turn the TV on. And we, we, we hear, you know, Judas Smith or Stephen Furtick. Those guys can preach. And uh, you know, that's, that's become my church and things like that. But God, that's not the way that God wants us to live church. And it's so easy to forget who we are. We are God's people. And that's what the enemy wants to use, everything that happens in our lives to make us forget who we are. But God wants you. He told the people of Israel, when you go through this, grab the stones. Grab the stones from where? From the solid ground. Your own personal experience is going to come from you having that relationship with God. It's solid ground. It means that it's the word of God. You're going through the word of God in the middle of everything that is happening. In the middle of a move of God or not. Then you stand on that solid ground, and then you grab your own experience. You, you grab, this is a personal experience. I'm going to grab this. And the Bible says, and he told them, grab it. You said, as a testimony, when your kids say, what are those things? You're going to tell them it's for what God did in my life. We tend to forget. Grab the own personal experience. Get a hold of those. Write them down. Write the promises of God down. You know, have a, I have a notebook here with everything. Every time somebody prays for me and then it's like significant for me, I write it down. Because, you know, I tend to forget the promises of God. When you are going through a hard time, go back to those moments when you see the Lord parted the waters. He can part them now again in my life. Psalm 43 Four and six, it says here, I am losing all hope. This is David. This is David. This is King David who conquered, who who was walking with God. You know, he said this, I am losing all hope. David, you? I thought it's just me. You know, Pepe, I'm dealing with everything. But you, David, you sit on your throne, you're king. You win battles. Come on, you write beautiful songs. Right? King David, he says, I'm losing all hope. If you are losing, imagine me. I'm worse than you. But he says, I am losing. I am paralyzed with fear. You, David, King David, mighty in war, mighty, like a mighty warrior, king of Israel. I am paralyzed with fear. That happens to all of us. Are you going through fear right now? What is con- are you paralyzed with fear right now? Are you paralyzed with fear right now? What is stopping you? What is stopping you in your life? Fear? Why? Because you fell? Because you were exposed? Because somebody put you down? Because somebody hurt you? Because somebody betrayed you? Because you fail at doing something? Because you keep on falling into that thing that you say you will never do again? What is paralyzing you? What is it? What is stopping you from having your own experience with God? King David, mighty David, he says, I'm losing all hope. He says, I am paralyzed with fear. But this thing I do, this one thing I do, I remember the days of old. I remember what? 
Israel, I'm going to part the, the Jordan River so you remember what I did back at the Red Sea. Israel, I want you to pick up stones of that experience and put them so when you come in fear, when you are facing the new giants and the enemies and you're going to face in this new territory, you remember who is with you. You remember whose hand led you to this place. You're going to remember that personal experience with him. David said, I remember the days of old. I remember these days. And I ponder of your great works. And I think about what you have done. And this is the result. Number six, it says, and then I lift up my hands to you in prayer. And I thirst for you as parched land thirst for rain. God wants you and I to remember. Write down your own experience with God. Write down your testimony. Write down the, the promises of God. Tell them to yourself. Read them. Repeat them. When I fail, I repeat them. I am a son of God. I may lose everything here on earth, but he's building a mansion for me. Are you with me, church? I remember that. When the enemy says, you just sin. That's it. There's no forgiveness for you. And says, no, 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 no. He died on the cross for me. And I, I hurt him. Yes, I did. My disobedience hurt him. But his love never stopped. And his love can change me and restore me and bring me back to that place. I remember what he's done for me on the cross. That's why we come to church. Why? Constant reminders of the goodness and the faithfulness of God. I'm losing all hope. I am paralyzed with fear, but I remember the days of old, and I ponder upon your great works, and I think about what you have done. Then I lift up my hands in you in prayer, and I thirst for you. How many people here thirst for the Lord? And number three, and this is it. I'm done. <laughs> Share your experience with others. Of what God has done in your life. The Lord said you're going to go have your own experience of the Red Sea. Now in the Jordan River. You're going to write down the testimonies. You're going to write. You're going to remember what the Lord has done. So when people ask you. What are those things? How come you're always happy? You, I hate you. <laughs> you're going through something. And you are smiling. That's not a fake smile. You're going through something and you can sleep. You cannot make yourself sleep the way you sleep. But they're going to ask you, when your kids ask you, what are those things? You tell them, it's what the Lord has done in me. What the Lord has done in me. Share your experience with others. I love people who share their experience with others. You know what? People can argue religion. People can argue your theology. People can argue your beliefs. But no one can argue your experience. No one can argue your experience. Oh, I don't go to church because of this and this and that. Oh, I don't read the Bible because ah, I contradict. No, it doesn't. Um, I, I, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, everything, everything, everything they can come and argue with you. But the touch from God in your life, a healing experience, a provision experience, no one can argue that. And that's what God told the people of Israel. Bring those stones so nobody can argue your experience, the experience that you have with me. And your experience is your testimony. Church, are we crossing into what is coming? Do we want to go to those places where you've never been before? Are you, if you're new here in Christ, well, maybe, maybe, maybe you've never even given your life to Jesus before. And you say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this coming to church thing a try. I, I'm, I'm going to give this thing a try. You maybe never had an own experience. Or maybe you used to go to church years ago. Something happened to you. Maybe, maybe some of you are here 
for the first time after being rejected at church, we are really bad at representing Jesus. I, I want to, first of all, I want to apologize if that's you. If you're here back from never been going to church before because you were hurt by, by a leader, by a pastor, by serving, I want to apologize. We are horrible at representing Jesus. If you're here, never been in a church before, and you just got tired of your friend telling you to come, to come, it's like, oh, fun, you know, so I'll go with you. <laughs> You've never been in a church before because you hear the things that we do sometimes in social media and things like that, or the things that we say. I want to apologize. Like, I want to say this. We are bad at representing the God of the Bible. If you read this book, you're going to see that a lot of the things that we do are contra it contradicts the loving God, the forgiving God, the Jesus who gave turn the other chick when they slap him, the Jesus that didn't defend himself when they, was, when, when they wanted to bring him to the cross, the Jesus that say, my kingdom is not of this earth. You, you're going to see here the teachings of Paul that said, don't pay somebody bad for bad the teachings of jesus says you know when they, when your enemy persecute you bless them you, you you're going to find in this book the amazing things it says forgive others just like i have forgiven you the things that say love your enemies jesus has love you. you you're gonna find in this book amazing things that you're gonna say how, how come i haven't seen that represented so well, we, we are humans. We are all trying. You know, I'm not coming with excuse. We need to live according to the scriptures. But we will never live according to the scriptures until we have a personal experience with him. Because it's not going to be the testimony of others anymore. It's going to be my personal testimony. It's going to be me and him. And you're going to see that church is the most fun amazing place to be you're going to see that following jesus is the best adventure you have just started in your life i promise you that that i can promise you it's not going to be easy it's going to be adventurous it's going to be hard sometimes but it's going to be real and in this world we want real because it's so fake so fake people fighting and killing each other for what for this reason and others for this reason it's like many reasons what is the truth when you find jesus you know the real god not the religious god the real god i want to pray for you